Hi there, it's Mrs. Gabriel again. I am going to try to fly through chapter six, module 20. And this is where I'm going to talk a little more about species interactions. So these are the objectives and the answers to module 19. Feel free to pause and look at them. Moving right along. So species interactions are, there's, there's four interactions, competition, predation, parasitism, and herbivory. Competition, say it. Predation, say it. Parasitism and herbivory. So a symbiotic relationship is one between two species. Any of these can be symbiotic relationships. Negative species interactions specifically are these. We're going to talk more about competition and competitive exclusion by looking at some charts, but you need to know this part down here. When two species have the same realized niche, one species will perform better and drive the other to extinction. Okay, here's an example of the effects of competition for a limiting resource. On the top two charts, we see that two different species living separately from the other population thrives. Look at the carrying capacity and notice what happens when they have to share the same limiting resource. So we have a, a carrying capacity of over 200 individuals living in this area. And then we have another Petri dish, a paramecium, let's say, that they, and notice that we have like this J-shaped curve that then turns into an S-shaped curve, logistic growth. So 150, approximately 150 of paramecium of this species can live in this Petri dish. But then when we put them together, when we put them together, they have to share the same limiting resource, which is food in this case for this, for this experiment, and one outcompetes the other. So let's look up close at something like this. Now read this to yourself. Pause if needed. This is about Gauss's experiment. I just explained it. So food supply controls population growth. And this is everything I just explained. So feel free to pause this part of the video and read it to yourself if you don't remember things about limiting resources and then competition. So one species is gonna, gonna win. And I'm not gonna read all this to you. You can pause and read. I'll point out an important point. The last statement, the amount of food is a density dependent factor. This is the most important piece. If you don't remember carrying capacity K and, and the importance of K, then go ahead and read that stuff to yourself with a pause. I won't read to you. But this part here, food is a density dependent factor. Okay. When competition occurs between two populations, one will outcompete the other. We just saw that in Gauss's experiment. Here is an example with overlap. Notice where the species originally overlapped in competition for medium, medium seeds. So both species, species one and species two, ate seeds. Species one eats the small and medium seeds. Species two eats the medium and large seeds. Species two evolved into a group who only ate big seeds. Natural selection favored those survivors in species two that do not compete for medium seeds. An overlap is not something that makes any species or any populations happy. They don't like that overlap. And that's what I just explained, feel free to pause. And here it is again. So when two species overlap in their use of a limiting resource, that's the medium, that's the medium sized seeds, selection favors those individuals of each species whose use of the resource overlaps the least with that of the other species. And over many generations, the species can evolve to reduce their overlap altogether and they partition their use of the limiting resource, which is gonna bring us to the next part, which is resource partitioning. So remember, resource partitioning can occur when two species divide a resource. The populations are both gonna survive and natural selection will favor those who do not use the overlap space. 
So species one is the competitor that won the small and medium speed, um, seeds. All right, let's look at more resource partitioning information. So we have our temporal, which is like night and day. That's one example. We have our spatial resource partitioning, and we have our morphological resource partitioning. So wolves and coyotes that live together exhibit both spatial and temporal resource partitioning. They try to stay out of each other's territories. They face competition for a shared limiting resource, but have evolved to reduce their competition by partitioning their resources temporally, which means at different times. Wolves tend to be more active in the evening and coyotes more like midnight to dawn. Plants can also partition temporally by flowering at different times of the year. Okay, um, just some pictures that I stole just for you to understand a little more and have another example of temporal resource partitioning. This guy right here is an okapi and an okapi goes to the watering hole at night. The elephants go during the day. Therefore, there's not too much crowding. They have a temporal resource, um, a temporal resource partition here by not having the overcrowding, which eliminates the competition. If species reduce competition by using different habitats, they're exhibiting spatial resource partitioning. Desert plant species have evolved a variety of different root systems that reduce competition for water and soil nutrients. Some may have very deep roots and others have shallow roots. Black gamma has shallow roots that extend over a large area that captures rainwater, but the tar bush send roots deep into the ground to tap deep resources or sources of water. Species of predatory weasels exhibit morphological resource partitioning, like differences in skull and tooth size allow each species to specialize on different sizes of their prey. Um, Darwin's finches with the different types of beaks also allowed each species to eat different foods, different seeds. That's an example of morphological resource partitioning, which remember reduces competition among the animals. Okay, so populations have different prey defenses as well. This helps them to survive. So I think this is kind of fun. Where's the flounder in here? And the flounder is right there. So the prey defense that this stone flower flounder exhibits is camouflage, which makes it difficult for predators to see it. That's a predator prey defense. a porcupine which has really sharp spines to protect this porcupine from predators. It's a prey defense. What's going on here? Well, one is the poison dart frog and the other is the non-toxic frog called the Zapporo. The Zapporo mimics the appearance of the poison dart frog as a prey defense because a bird's gonna see the poison dart frog and know that that tastes poisonous, doesn't taste good at all, makes it sick, and anything it starts seeing that looks the same as it, it's gonna be like, uh-uh, I don't wanna eat that poison. So even though it's not a poison dart frog, dart, dart frog, the mimicry helps it escape predators. All right, then we have symbiotic relationships that I did mention earlier. So this is an acacia tree that we're looking at. Acacia trees and ants have each evolved adaptations that enhance their interaction, like helps their interaction. The tree's thorns serve, here's like the inside of a thorn, serve like as a nest site for the ants. And this is a mutualistic relationship. The most important type of mutualistic interaction is the relationship between plants and their pollinators, like birds, bats, insects. Plants need it for reproduction. Pollinators depend on the plants for food. But this is the ants taking care of the tree by protecting it and the tree um, protecting it from herbivory behavior and then the tree providing the nesting site and some sweet food. So that's mutualism. And I just explained these. You can pause and you can read it to yourself if you need to. So pollinators, um, I'm just going to interrupt this programming for a minute to share this little bit of information about pollinators 
We really need them. Without them, our plants will not thrive. And that is the bottom of our food chain, including all humans. That would be disastrous for humans. You all know about bees. And whenever anyone probably has asked you about pollinators, bees are the only thing that come to mind. But there are other important pollinators, and these are all it. And I'll explain what their role is. So notice that they're all touching the inside of a flower. They all get to the inside of a flower. Love them and respect them. And just in case you don't know how pollination works, I decided to sneak in another slide of stolen pictures. Plants and pollinators, remember, have a mutualistic interaction. So plants benefit by the reproduction. Pollinators benefit by getting food from the plants. Just look at the pics, and then you can find the male parts and the female parts first. So the male parts are the stamens, and the female parts are the pistil. The male parts provide what would be counterpart to human sperm. Female parts, the pistil, receive the pollen through the stigma. The pollen then reaches the ovary to fertilize the eggs inside. Look for those parts. Mutualism is shown here with lichens. Lichens are all over the place. You probably see them on rocks and on trees. Lichens are actually fungus and algae that have a mutualistic relationship. They're like together. So the fungus provides nutrients and protection and the algae provides carbohydrates from the photosynthesis and those carbohydrates are in the form of glucose and they both benefit. Aww. And then there's Nemo, the clownfish, and the sea. For protection, clownfish seek refuge amongst the tentacles of sea anemones. These sea anemones, by the way, are animals. They're not plants, just in case you didn't know. So um, the tentacles contain these like harpoon-like stinging capsules, and those are called nematocysts. And the anemones employ those to sting and capture prey and ward off predators. In a little bit of a conflict of agreement and it's kind of a biological mystery, clownfish have mucus on their skin that somehow protect them against the sting of the anemone. As a result, the clownfish can hang out inside an anemone and they're able to stick near their their host, which is avoided by most other fish in the sea. So the clownfish gets protected, protection by hiding in the sting-free zone. And if you remove the clownfish, large butter butterfly fishes will eat the anemones. So the butterfly fish are considered predators of the sea anemone and the clownfish are protecting the sea anemone. Ta-da! So that's a mutualistic relationship. All right, this is a relationship in which one species benefits, but the other it doesn't benefit, it's not harmed, and it's not helped. And that is an example of commensalism. Other examples include birds using trees as perches and fish using coral reefs to hide from predators. So commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism, remember, are all symbiotic relations. This is the relationship of two species that live in close association with one another. Just keep remembering that. Now here we're looking at the cattle egret and an example of commensalism. So the cattle egret forages in the fields among the cattle and other livestock. And as the cattle moves through the field, horses and, and other livestock with it kind of um, cause movements that stir up the insects that are all on the field. As the insects get stirred up, the egrets following, you know, all the other animals that are stirring things up, the egrets actually just hang out on the back here and they catch and they feed upon all the little bugs that are flying up. The egrets benefit from this relationship because the livestock have helped them find their meals but the livestock gets nothing out of it. That's commensalism. So in a nutshell, you need to know these definitions and the examples of each. Pause if you need to and study them. 
All right, we need to look at interactions among species to determine which species can live in a community together. This table summarizes the interactions and the effects that they have on each of the interacting species, whether positive, negative, or neutral. So you're gonna pause the video, you're gonna guess what the interaction is according to the instructions, and when you're ready, you're gonna play and pause again so you can see how you did. All right, so competition for a limiting resource has negative effects on both of the competing species. And predation has a positive effect on the predator only. You get that? Okay, make sure that you pause and read these definitions and I'll go over examples of them a little bit, but I think they're very obvious. So invisible to the naked eye, harmless to humans, and natural enemy of pest insects, parasitic wasps, roam the landscape looking for an unsuspecting host in which to lay eggs. While these parasitic interactions can kill a host, many parasitic interactions actually do not always kill their host. Ticks are one of them, and I think you're very familiar with them. So I stole this picture just for you so you can kind of see like we have a lot of these ticks in Hartford County, a lot of them. And I have, I have actual examples of ticks that were collected for an SRT capstone project one year in my classroom, which I will be sharing with you guys to look at really soon. They're super, super tiny. But these are most common in Hartford County here, and these are not as common in our county. And again, oh, that was parasitism. All right, then we have herbivory. Make sure you read that. Many herbivores can affect producer populations. Producers are plants. So the producers have evolved, a lot of plants have evolved with defenses in order to get the herbivores away, such as in this picture that I stole. They kind of just release toxins that'll, that'll make them, and the toxins might only work against a certain pest. When new ones come along, the plant hasn't evolved with any kind of surviving toxin. Okay. Keystone species. I need you to know about keystone, keystone species and ecosystem engineers, and sometimes they're called both. And these are the most important species in a community. Without them, the community falls apart. Those previous examples of interspecific interactions can affect the abundance and distribution of species in a community, and usually the extinction of a single species does not affect the stability of a whole community or ecosystem. Sometimes, however, the loss of just one species from a community can have a disproportionately large effect on the entire community. This, this type of species, is what we call a keystone species. And it's so much more important than its relative abundance might suggest. This arch is a symbol showing where the name keystone species came from. It's showing a stone arch where the keystone is the single center stone that supports all the other stones. Without it, the arch collapses. Typically, it is the species that exists in very low numbers. They may be predators, they may be sources of food, they're usually mutualistic species or providers of some other service. For example, a keystone species here is the sea star. In an experiment, the researchers did with sea stars and their predators and mussels, this is what they found out. With the predator sea stars, they removed them and they kept another um, plot where they were not removed. And in the plot where they removed them, the mussels that they typically ate ended up overcrowding and dominated 25 and outcompeted 25 other species that declined. So all of their species richness declined. Other examples of keystone species include these guys. They're prairie dogs. They contribute to the soil and water quality in the plains. They forage and their foraging retains water in the soil and forces fresh new grasses to grow. Young grasses have more nutrients for species, such as like bison and elk that need to eat them. So if the prairie dogs don't do their thing with foraging, 
then the bison and the elk are not going to survive in that ecosystem. That is why they are keystone species. Then we have elephants on the African grasslands. I bet a lot of you didn't know. Um, and savannas. They graze on trees, such as these acacia trees. And they prevent them from growing all the way to maturity. So there's not a whole lot of these trees on the savanna. If they didn't graze on the little baby acacia trees, then they're not there. If they didn't graze on them, they would grow to maturity and there would be a lot more of them. And if there's a lot more of them, the grassland will turn into a forest. And then never mind our savanna or grassland. Here we have a mother and pup sea otter, and they help the kelp forest habitat. This is kelp, all these plants right here. Kelp um, is a type of giant seaweed, and it's home to hundreds of species, including sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp. Sea otters eat sea urchins, preventing an overpopulation of the sea urchins from destroying the kelp. Because remember, if the kelp isn't here, then all those other species that rely on kelp for survival also are no longer here. Sometimes a keystone species is referred to as an ecosystem engineer. The North American beaver is a prime example. Beavers have a critical role in forest community. They build dams that convert narrow streams into large ponds thereby creating new habitat for pond-adapted plants and animals. And here's a beaver dam. Okay, so the Module 20 answers are right here, and I'm going to do Module 21 in a follow-up video. That's the end of Chapter 6, Module 20. Have a great day.